Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Spaulding, the issue isn't whether or not the Constitution shouldn't be changed over time. The issue is who changes it and how it's done. Isn't that right? Uh, th that's correct. Uh, and, and to go back to this, this point, um, the, the founders weren't infallible, but they created a, a framework we call the Constitution and its structure, which has served us well to this day. It is precisely the responsibility of Congress as the legislative branch closest to consent and Congress to make by, those adjustments. Right, and Congress, by two-thirds votes in the House and the Senate, passed the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery, and Congress, by two-thirds uh, votes in the House and the Senate, and by the way, then going to the states for ratification by three-quarters of the state legislatures in each case, uh, extended uh, the right of citizenship to people who had previously been slaves, and Congress, uh, by virtue of the 19th Amendment, extended the right to vote to women all of which uh, properly should have been done. Uh, we would probably agree uh, with the gentleman from Tennessee that these took too long to occur. They were wrong in the first place, but the Constitution itself was created with a device to make those changes. Does the Constitution give the President of the United States the authority to make those changes uh, without uh, the consent of the people through their elected representatives or without seeking to have the Constitution changed? No, absolutely not, nor does it give that power to the judiciary. Those uh, two institutions, especially executive, are there for particular purposes to, uh, pur purposes to act in light of legislative action through the lawmaking process. Uh, that's why, precisely, Congress is the first uh, branch, uh, and it's the primary branch as intended by the founders. Is there anything in Professor Vladek's testimony that you'd like to respond to? Well, I, I think it's uh, interesting the, the extent to which there's actually a lot of agreement here in a certain way, ex the difference being that uh, he thinks it's a good thing, whereas I would probably think it's a bad thing. Um, when the executive does not have authority, he's not free to act as he chooses. Um, uh, there is a lot of ambiguity in laws, how they're written. There's, there are interpretive uh, debates. Um, but short of that, the executive can't do whatever they want. I, I would strongly encourage this task force to actually flesh out his three types of distinctions uh, between uh, of, of executive actions and, and uh, focusing on those that are the most problematic. And here well, I'm in agreement with him. And point of fact, we're always going to have differences of interpretation of laws and even of the Constitution itself between the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. But what we're about here is recognizing that over time, for a variety of reasons, uh, the growth of the size of the federal bureaucracy, uh, the transfer of power by the Congress to that bureaucracy by passing laws that uh, contain with them massive regulations uh, and other actions taken by the Congress, the Congress's powers are diminished. The Congress is the body of the three most close to the people because all of us are direct, directly are elected by the people. In the House, uh, very sensitive because every two years uh, we're up for re-election. Only two people in the entire multi-million uh, person executive branch are elected by the people, the president and the vice president, and no one on the United States Supreme Court uh, is directly elected by the people. So the issue before this task force is to determine how best to restore those powers to the United States Congress, not whether there aren't going to be differences of opinion. Sure they are, but what ways can the Congress assert itself to make sure that when it recognizes that it passed laws that are being misinterpreted by uh, a president, uh, that they are able to restore their authority. You know, that, that's why looking at this process we refer to as the separation of powers is so crucially important. Not as a legal technical matter on this or that specific thing, but as a general matter. This, this body should act as a constitutional institution in reclaiming those powers. And that should be true whether it's a Democratic Congress or a Republican Congress and a Democratic President or a Republican President. If you don't have that back and forth, you have no check. And if you have no check, you have nothing to, to prevent the executive or the judiciary from doing as they wish and going forward. Let me briefly go to Mr. Postel and Mr. Capretta and ask you, what do you think are the best reforms for us to consider that would restore the role of Congress as originally understood? Well, I think, um, as I try to suggest in my written and uh, oral testimony, that Congress needs more leadership from within the Congress in order to ensure that it's not following leadership outside of the Congress. So, Mr. Capretta, I would get a list. Of, pardon me. I'd get a list of all the programs that have now gotten permanent spending authority, and especially the outside the major entitlements, which I, which I don't think will be changed and look at those that have some spending authority that doesn't require them to come back to the Congress on a regular basis 
and review those as to see if they're appropriately getting that funding or not and change the statute and require those many of those programs to get annual funding from the Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.